Welcome to the Computer History Museum. Scott Cook, it's, a, it's an honor to have you here for your oral history. <coughs> Today is July 22nd, 2019, and I'm Marguerite Gong Hancock from the Exponential Center here with Eileen Fagan. And we're interested in having for the record here at the museum your story. So can we begin at the beginning and ask for the record when and where you, were you born? And can you tell us a little bit about your family and the heritage and values that influenced you as a young person? Uh, born in Glendale, California, on July 26th, 1952. Birthday is just around the corner. Birthday's coming up this week. Um, uh, well, let's see, the parents, uh, my father was certainly a product of the Depression. Um, he grew up very poor in Milwaukee, single mom. His father died when he was five and a single unskilled mother in the Depression is not a good picture. So they lived in attics. She, uh, her sister also uh, was a single mom, had two kids, so they kind of roomed together. So that kind of gave him an uh, older brother and a younger sister, quote, they were cousins. But um, the life was tough then. He tells stories about having to fight his way through ethnic neighborhoods to get to school kind of ethnic gangs controlled the various neighborhoods and if you were from the outside they didn't allow you to pass unless you fought your way and fortunately his older cousin was big and tough so but my dad as a little kid tried to teach me to box I seem to have no talent for that but um, not an educated family in fact he spent all farmers these were all farm stock so uh, he spent uh, his summers uh, out at the uncle's farm because that way he could work as a kid and he wouldn't have to buy him food because the farm had food. Um, uh, no one in the family had gone to college. Uh, and he might have headed the same way, but somehow he, tells, he told the story. Only when he did his bio late in life did I learn that somehow he got into Boy Scouts. And in Boy Scouts there was a leader who saw him and could tell he had potential, so somehow got him a job with the local museum, uh, the Museum of Natural History, and one of the scientists um, took a liking to him and took him out and made my dad his assistant. So he got connected to science, to people who were university educated. And then when he was in college, the same man uh, <clears throat> came to him and said, we're going to go out and visit a college. And I, certainly my dad didn't have any of the money to go to college, and it was not a thing in his family. But the man took him out and to a, a university, private college called Lawrence, and they gave him admission and a scholarship. Um, so um, then World War II happened, and he was an officer in the Supply Corps in the Navy. Um, so he got leadership responsibilities there. Um, the, my mom grew up, uh, her dad always had a job through the Depression, which was a, a, and this was working for the Kimberly Clark Company in Appleton, Wisconsin. And so, but they um, always had a passion for education. If I can remember my mom saying from when I was really little, you're gonna go to college, you really wanna go to college. And she went to college for just a year and a half or two years, and that's where she met my dad. Uh, but she was not highly educated herself, but uh, it just was, you know, college was never an if or uh, it was a when. Um, and she was the one who always urged me to go to the front of the class and listen and ask questions. And um, so, oh, hard work. Um, uh, we did not take a family vacation until, I mean, a real honest-to-goodness vacation until I was 16. So my dad never took vacations. He was always working. Um, and if, what was his business? Uh, his he work? worked, um, you know, there are car dealers who sell cars made in the Midwest? Well, in the heavy equipment industry, the same thing exists. Uh, there are equipment dealers who sell uh, cranes and diggers and backhoes and line trucks that are made by companies in the Midwest. 
So he was in those local distributors here in California. Uh, and then some of them started making their own things, so he did that as well. So heavy equipment, um, distribution, sales, and production. Thank you. You were saying that he worked continuously. Yeah. And if he wasn't working at work, uh, I mean, he'd leave early and come home late simply because of the traffic in L.A. And if he wasn't working at work, we were doing home projects because he would never spend money to pay somebody to do something. So that meant we painted the house and we replaced the transmission in the car and we built the carport and we built the deck and um, we replumbed the house. And so, um, so hard work was certainly a value. Um, uh, and getting things done. He, I remember a saying he had, it came out of the Navy, I guess, um, about responsibility and getting things done. It went something like, um, I know men in the ranks, you know men in the ranks, men who are in the ranks simply because they lack the ability to get things done. So that was, he was Mr. Get Things Done and move on. Um, I wasn't a terribly warm fellow, um, so we were not close. But that was then offset by my mom, who was all love and caring, deep caring, uh, the most caring person you'd, you'd know. <clears throat> she couldn't get anything done, but it didn't matter. She cared deeply. Um, her projects always seemed to keep going and going and going. Um, so they were two quite opposites. Um, very frugal as well. Um, uh, so, so against that backdrop with these values of hard work and education, uh, getting things done, <coughs> as a young student, I understand that you, you, were, you began with a job um, long at a young age. What, do you remember what your first job was? Um, yeah, uh, the job history, kind of a... Uh, you know, I think it's interesting how jobs teach you more about work and about yourself than they teach you about the job itself. These early jobs, the early jobs you get like in high school. Oh, the first job was doing yard work for a neighbor. Um, uh, and he finally came out. Now, you know, I figured when you get a job, you just keep working as fast as you could. That's what I grew up at home with. He finally came out and urged me to take breaks and stop for lunch and things like that. Um, I'm on his nickel. I shouldn't be relaxing. Then, um, then I got a job uh, in a small manufacturing company painting slats of wood that they were then going to chop up and turn into blinds. Um, then I got a job at the local men's store so I could leave my paint splattered clothes behind and sell, clothes, uh, sell clothing in a men's store. And that was fascinating. I, there I learned a lot more because there you had to you weren't just doing what someone else told you. You, you had to respond to customers coming in. Um, and uh, so that was observing a small business uh, uh, up close. So that was, I learned more from that. Then I got, I did research work in college. They, they were offering federal grants to do research in air pollution. Uh, in LA, air pollution at the time was a really big deal. The smog problem was, was really uh, tough. Um, actually, I should rewind. We're going through the job history. Then from the men's uh, clothes thing, I was able to get a job with the, uh, through my father who knew people at the local power utility, that's Southern California Edison. I got a job working in their yard, their truck yard, which maintained all the line equipment that puts the wires up in the air, maintained the vehicles for the executives. And I was the entry level person uh, in a summer intern job. Um, and it, that was an amazing experience about the nature of work in the United States. Um, here the pay was double what I got in the men's store, and the work was a, a third as hard. Uh, so I, I w was one of three guys on the wash rack. So the wash rack is where the trucks and the cars roll in, and you wash them to get them ready for the mechanics. And then you had to wash a whole bunch of cars the executives were in. So I'd line the cars up, and I'd be working through, and I'd get all the stuff done. And then I found within two days the other employees, the lifers, had blocked the entrances so I could no longer line the cars up because this job could have been done by one person. 
but they had three people doing it. And these people worked at third speed. One of them took a creeper, you know, it's the thing you roll under a truck, and it, after lunch he'd put the creeper under a truck out in the yard and go to sleep. And so they didn't want any young whippersnapper showing that this job could be done e uh, so much faster. They wanted to make it look like, boy, you had to work all day. So they were blocking my ability to get the work done. So that's what happens in an environment where uh, you lose control of your workforce and the workforce is not, you're not managing. Um, so it was a union workshop. So uh, they were optimizing for things other than getting the work done. Um, and so that was shocking to me. It was shocking to me that anybody could work at a place and intentionally not be trying to get the work done fast uh, and efficiently. Um, so that was an eye-opening experience. Uh, it's also where I met the first person who I knew who then died. Who then died? Died. Oh, you know, so when you grow up young, you don't typically have people you know that die. Mm -hmm. That's reserved. But this widened the circle of people I knew, and one of the workmen died over the summer. And that was, a, wow, I was just talking to him two days ago. So that kind of rocks your world. So anyway, that's what I was doing summers. And then school, there was the, um, I was looking at the bulletin boards they had that advertised concerts and things, and there was this poster saying, uh, federal research grants available for research in air pollution. Now, L.A., particularly where we lived, in the smoggy side of town, um, L.A. was, you know, was, uh, air pollution was really awful. and So we'd been learning in economics class, well, the way you control these things, ideally, is you tax behaviors you don't want, and that gives everyone an incentive to do less. So I grabbed a buddy of mine, really good buddy, and said, hey, let's file for one of these grants and see if we can do research on how to use a tax regime to uh, control and induce lower air pollution in uh, the Los Angeles Basin. So we didn't know. We, we were sophomores at the time. Uh, and we didn't know what we were doing, but we wrote up a grant proposal and submitted it. And by God, we got a federal grant <laughs> as sophomores. Um, Congratulations. Uh, so this actually turned out to be life-changing because I'd been, uh, and my buddy as well, we were on a trajectory to go into economics, we were econ and math majors, both of us, and get uh, a PhD and become a researcher or a professor in, um, in economics. So this just looked like an earlier start to that. So we got, a, got the grant and then we did the research and boy, we learned how to do a giant project, produce a book this thick. Um, and uh, then, um, uh, there was a research competition. One of our professors entered our research, that, um, our research document uh, into this graduate student research competition. Now, at this point, we were only juniors, um, and this was a competition for graduate students. So that's, he entered it, didn't ask us. Anyway, then we made the finals, and so we had to drive up to uh, Monterey, to, to um, uh, Pebble Beach where they had the finals at an econ conference, and they announced the winner. And also, with a paper in contention, was one of our TAs. Well, they announced that we won. <laughs> and the TA, the graduate student who was teaching us, didn't win. So that was a heady experience. And so, boy, I was thinking, this research thing really works. Um, that paper got noticed by the head of uh, the economics section of the Air Resources Board here in California, which is the Air Pollution Regulatory Authority. And he was looking for a summer intern, so he interviewed me, and I got a job now working in my field in Sacramento with the head of the agency. And my goal was to change the world. It's air pollution problems out of control. Now I'm actually with the regulatory authority. I thought, wow, this is going to really accelerate the ability to change the world and get things adopted that will drive behaviors in the right direction. And that was so helpful because then I learned how painfully slow it is to work in a government agency. How, boy, if you want progress and change the world, that may be the worst place to be. I worked there two summers. I enjoyed what I did. But it made it look, it, you could see the people who were influential, who actually drove the direction of policy, weren't the experts with the PhDs. It was the administrators, the guy who ran the agency was the guy who had the influence to drive what happened in working with the legislature and what happened in air pollution policy in the state. It wasn't a specialist. So that was, that caught my attention. And then at the same time in 
in school. So when I was a junior, I showed up at the ski club meeting because I wanted to, I was learning to ski. I thought I'd go on a trip or something. This is at USC. At USC. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the uh, head of the Student Recreation Association, all the clubs, the recreation clubs, re report in as one, prof one administrator. And he stood up and said, okay, well, is the president from the ski club here? And there was like 500 people in the room or 300 in the room. Well, how about any officers? I went looking around. Turns out everyone had graduated. And there was nothing, no plan, no nothing. So he said, well, who wants to be president? Well, I'd been talking to people. Hey, let's get a ski trip together. We'll go to Utah and try that. So several people pointed to me and said, him. Well, nobody was foolish enough to run against me, so I was suddenly the president of the ski club. Um, so I figured, okay, well, there's no programs. How are we going to put together something? And by the end of the second year, so that was the beginning of the junior year, by the time I graduated, uh, our ski club was now the largest campus organization at USC and the largest ski club in the state that charged dues. And we had trips to various states. We had a ski cabin all winter long that people could stay at for a buck a night. And we had a whole bunch of programs. A buck a night? Yeah, yeah. No, the thing is you rent it for the whole season and you get such a discount because then the owner knows that they've got reliable money coming in. You get such a discount and then you throw lots of beds and mattresses in. So you get, you, so yeah, we uh, priced it at a buck a night, weeknights, two bucks a night, weekends. Um, and uh, so that was a lot of fun. Here I was producing a product, a set of services that really, uh, that people liked, that made their lives better, and I could create quite an organization. Um, so that's when I switched saying, well, this economics thing doesn't look as fun or as impactful. And business seems to be a way to, I mean, this ski club was just a little business. It's just you couldn't keep the profits. The profits stayed with the school. So that's when I switched and decided to get an MBA. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, that's probably too long of an answer to your question. That was perfect. I'd like, before we jump ahead to you going to HBS, I would like to pursue another thread, and that is your interest in computers, mm -hmm. and ask when did you first get exposed? I think I read something about your experience with the 1620. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. your first exposure to, c to computing and technology. Yeah. Um, well, I did science projects in uh, elementary school, and in fifth grade, my science project was on uh, computers. And that was more hardware-oriented, just understanding how software logic and binary math works. Um, but then in high school, uh, I was roaming through the, the main library and just going through the shelves looking for things. It was just interesting to explore and what, what was the book next to the book you were looking for. And I found a book, newly written, I don't think anyone had checked it out yet, on computers. And it actually taught you how to program computers. So, oh, and it's a big, thick green book. So, oh, that looks interesting. So I checked that out and I started reading and wow, your mind was opening how you could cause this machine to do things um, by writing symbolic stuff. So I used that to teach myself how to write uh, programs. And I was interested in this work that had been done in blackjack where they did computer simulations and were able to figure out better strategies for playing blackjack based on the cards that had fallen already, thus what are the cards that were remaining to be dealt. And I thought, well, maybe apply the same logic to the game of Baccarat, uh, which is a card game similar in some ways to Blackjack. So I started writing a program to uh, simulate in the computer the play of um, Baccarat. Uh, now, the problem was I didn't have a computer. In fact, nobody had computers. Our high school did not have computers. Our school district had one, an IBM 1620 that they used, I think, for payroll and accounting and was buried in the basement of the school district headquarters downtown, far from my home. But fortunately, my girlfriend's mom was the punch card operator. <laughs> How convenient. How <laughs> it's amazingly convenient. So she would take my coding sheets and she would punch out the cards and then she'd get the job run and then bring me back the results, which inevitably meant it didn't run because there were bugs. And then I'd try to debug it without any help from a debugger. Um, and then give her the change, change coding sheet. She'd go down and punch the cards and rerun it. So that was my introduction to computers, uh, was the IBM 1620. Um, uh, but then I got carried away with other interests. Boy, I would have given the world to have a computer at home. 
so I wouldn't have to. And one, you could program without cards, where you'd get immediate feedback on whether the job ran or not. Oh, that would have been heaven, absolute heaven. But I didn't live in that heaven. This was 1967 or 8. Um, so well before that heaven was a reality. It was yet to come. Yeah. So let's weave those two threads together. You've decided business is your interest, and you've decided to apply for business school. How did you make the decision on where to go? Ah, um, well, the trick getting into business school, particularly the top business schools, is I hadn't worked. And their recruiting is heavily skewed to people who have um, generally two or more years of work experience. Um, but I didn't see the value of that. I didn't understand that very well. So the trick was getting in. So I, you know, I learned, um, I didn't have the principle in mind yet, but I have an example of something that later became an important principle in my life, which is go find the best wheel maker. Don't reinvent the wheel. Go find the best wheel maker and learn from them how to make a wheel. So I was lucky that just as my interest changed to try to get into business school, with Stanford and Harvard being the two top schools at the time, I um, saw in our campus newspaper a little display ad saying, minority students interested in getting an MBA from Stanford, come to this information session. And Stanford was doing outreach to schools that had minority populations because they were not a very diverse, uh, Stanford MBA program was not very diverse. So they had uh, a, a faculty member or an admissions officer and a student come down and describe, well, you know, here's what we look for. Well, they're basically giving you the, the key to the test. Um, and they told, here's what we look for in admissions. So I was taking notes like this. And then just use that to say, okay, if that's what you're looking for, you write the application to the test. And what they were looking for was very different from what a grad school in economics, which was what I was more familiar with, was looking for. So I wrote a very different application. They were much more interested in things like the ski club, because that was running small business, than they were in the research. Because of that information section, I was session. Well, there's two reasons I got into both Harvard and Stanford. One was I went to that information session, so I learned from an expert. The other was, if you look, I later saw the admission application count, the number of applicants that HBS got. And just at the time of Watergate, there was a giant dip in MBA applications. And law school applications went way up because the heroes of Watergate were the lawyers. So I happened to, and this was tail end of the Vietnam era when business was kind of in, held in some disrepute among college students. I happened to apply right in the middle of the valley of reduced applicants. Perfect timing. So perfect timing to apply. So, uh, um, so you were admitted to both, and what led you to, to head to Cambridge? I'd grown up in California, never had been to the East Coast, and I figured I planned to return to California, but here was a great way, two years on the East Coast, to see the things I hadn't seen and to learn how that part of the world lives. So, um, Significant uh, professors yeah. or classmates that were really m made a difference or times that you point to and say that was, that was something significant in your journey during your Harvard years? I would say I struggled. Um, I started fast because early on they're just bringing you up to speed on things which have to do with economics and math and accounting, and I'd taken some accounting at, at USC. So early on I did great. Um, but then as the issues in the cases moved more to management, to leadership, uh, to business strategy, oh, I'd never worked in a real business. So I struggled. Um, Is that a difficult time that you... Yeah, uh, it was particularly because you had the fast start and then things got tougher. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I kind of figured out I really needed to go work somewhere that was really going to teach me. Um, and I think it, uh, and that's where maybe I would give the most credit for direction. I, I didn't know what I really wanted to do. I, I, I was so envious of other students who 
Many of them came out of finance, and they knew exactly what they wanted to do after school. In fact, they even know which investment bank they wanted to work for. I didn't know any of that. I had just, I felt clueless. Um, so I finally figured I had to narrow down to something, and I figured I wanted to go work for the Procter & Gamble Company because they were well-known as kind of the postgraduate degree in business and well-known to teach you. And, and they also had a culture, and I could tell this already, of focusing on developing great products because Consumers Reports is the magazine I've read the longest since I was in high school, and P&G products often, routinely, were at the top of their category when reviewed scientifically, when they were actually tested by Consumers Reports. And I admired that. I admired a company that really focused on trying to produce the best product in its category um, in product performance. So that aligned with my values. That sh you know, that's what companies should be trying to do. Um, and it was made even stronger when I interviewed, when I talked to one of my classmates who'd worked for Colgate over the summer, and I asked him about price. He said, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we know our products are often not as good as Procter & Gamble's, but we try to do it through marketing. And I said, phew, ixnay to that. That's not my belief at all. Don't try to sell people mediocre stuff. Um, so that was just values. So that became my uh, goal coming out of school. And I managed to get offers from a whole bunch of the consumer products companies, um, all except for the one where I fell asleep in the interview. Um, <laughs> What was that? Yeah, what was well, that? Well, they tell you before, <laughs> you know, they basically teach you the concept of test marketing. Before you interview with the company you really want to work with, go interview with a company that you don't really want to work with, just so you get practice. And then before you do a road trip visit, if a company asks you back, go do a road trip comp with a company you don't really want. So um, I didn't want to work for Heinz in Pittsburgh, but like nobody interviewed with them. So they started outreaching to students and say, come to Pittsburgh, come work for Heinz. So I figured, oh, okay, this will, be, this will be my practice road trip interview. But we were doing a student project, second year, and I was uh, leading the project team. So I was up all night going through the submissions and editing. Um, I was up all night in Pittsburgh in a hotel room doing this. So I got the next day into the interview, and the people were so dull. Oh, my God. One interview, the guy just talked about himself, never asked me a question. <laughs> Finally, I get to the big guy, and he was wearing this white shirt with a tiny collar and this pencil-thin tie. And this was the era when we were all wearing giant collars and big ties. Um, and glasses like the people in the NASA, uh, you know, in the moon launch. He was, just looked like a dinosaur. And his name, God, I remembered his name. Um, but he was so dull. And I started, it was after lunch, and I started getting sleepier, and my mind's ability to work kind of, you know, your mind shuts down. All I could remember was like the last few words he'd said. So then I would come up with a question related to the last few words he said, because I couldn't remember what he'd said two sentences ago. And then finally, finally it happened. Oh, God. <laughs> so I didn't get an offer from Heinz. It's the one place you didn't get an yeah, offer. <laughs> but I got offers from the rest of them. Um, uh, you know, General Foods, General Mills, and people like that. So I had a quandary of how to make the decision of which one to go to. So again, I thought, okay, I'll go talk to the experts again. So I went to the three of the marketing professors and asked them, hey, I've got these offers. Which one should I take? Because though P&G had been my going in one, I could tell from the town it was not really where I wanted to live. Um, and they all said, I asked each professor, here are the offers, what should I take? And they all said, well, oh, they're all great companies, great companies, yeah, they're really good, they're fine, you can't make a mistake, they're all good. So I said, okay, cut the crap. Really, which one should I go to? And all three, almost sotto voce, almost said, yeah, you should go to Cincinnati. And they were right. So that was, um, and that was, going to P&G did change my life, so. Before we go there, can, can I go back to one thing that I have to ask you? Why were you reading Consumer Reports from a very young age? <laughs> what, what is it about that? Like, that's not a thing that kids do. That's fair. Um, <laughs> that's, I don't know why. Um, 
Uh, my parents subscribed. Yourself. No, actually, no, they were too cheap to subscribe. We would go to the library to look up. When they were considering a major purpose purchase, we'd go to the library, so particularly cars, so they could check. Um, and I just found it fascinating to read about products, to read about what was the test methodology that was used, um, and to see how wide a range products delivered on the outcome results. Some were terrible, others were uh, much better. See the stuff on car reliability, how the cars varied so much. In fact, I remember the most reliable cars, this is before the Japanese changed the car industry, the most reliable vehicles made in America were trucks. The Ford F-150 and the Chevrolet equivalent were by far the most reliable vehicles. And who would have thought? How could that be? Um, so Maybe because they had to be, because people were using them to work. Maybe. Uh, yeah. I, I hard. Well, the, the vehicles were not very reliable back then, and, and the, the, this was a low bar. And so I, and, I don't know. It just fascinated me. And I, and I began to see on some of the products there was this moon and stars on the package. I wonder what was that? Well, it was the P&G logo. Uh, and then I started seeing the correlation. You know, Crest toothpaste, for example. Our dentist told mom she should be using Crest. So boom, she follows. You know, if an expert tells her something, we are all over it. And so we used Crest, and P&G invented how to put fluoride into toothpaste, uh, and did the clinical trials and all that to prove that out. And that was that was a big thing when you were a kid. Um, so um, I feel like yeah. that's kind of foundational, like that you so. did that so early, and that's a theme that has just gone on for you, thinking about the quality of a product. Mm -hmm. So I have one other question. I, at the time you were at Harvard, did you ever think, or even before, it sounds like maybe in the ski club you did, about running your own business? Where did that? Mm. So what was the genesis of Where the idea that of born? starting uh, your own company? When I was a little kid, I'd thought about doing that, even in high school. Um, I don't know why. I mean, I think there are some people who I think are natural in organizations, in sports teams and all that, but I was more of a, you know, the, the, a PhD track would have been more a fit for my nerd-like tendencies. Um, so the idea of starting something, I toyed with ideas in high school. I worked at the men's store. Oh, I know. Cufflinks at the time were made garish. And, at least those of us growing up, when I didn't want garish, bright things. That looked like you were uh, uh, something from, I don't know, from Vegas. So I toyed with the idea of taking natural woods like manzanita and polishing them and woodworking them and turning them into cufflinks. So I toyed with that idea. Um, so I toyed with some ideas. Um, uh, and it was really running the the ski club. I thought, this is fun, because you're, you're an entrepreneur, and that was because you could make something happen that a lot of people would, would want, um, that opened doors for them they couldn't open on their own. Uh, so that really hooked me on, uh, and then I can, uh, I think when I was in business school, I, uh, I don't think people saw me, my classmates saw me as running a large organization, as being the company man growing up in a large organization. Um, uh, there were many others who were much smoother at that. Um, I think everybody saw Peter Wendell, who was a section mate of mine, uh, who had worked at IBM. I think we all would have bet money he'd become the head of IBM. Uh, he was just typecast to do that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I can remember uh, yeah, I can remember in junior high thinking about how could I get the money, and I thought in order to start a business you had to have all the money already to start the business. I didn't know about this venture capital thing. So I was trying to figure out how I could make enough money to be able to start a business uh, when I got out of college. Um, so yeah, it had always been a, I don't know where Sort of came. a lifelong dream to um, start a company. What, what mm -hmm. would your classmates have thought that you would become? Well, I think there's a, a uh, slogan about successful entrepreneurs that behind every successful entrepreneur is a supportive spouse and surprised in-laws. Uh, <laughs> I think that would go for my classmates as well. I think they would be 
are, were, would not have expected this outcome. Uh, what would they have thought? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know what they would have forecast. Well, you mentioned that P&G was life-changing for you. Yeah. In, in what way? Oh, yeah, P&G was absolutely life-changing. I mean, it's, it's where I met Signe. Um, and without Signe, my life would be totally different and, and wrong. And, and it's where I learned the fundamentals of business. I learned much more at P&G about business than I learned in business school. I mean, one, I was there longer, four years. Uh, but two, you learn by doing. And, it, um, and cases are not the real world, as good as cases are as a teaching modality. Uh, and that's where I learned the principles of how you hire people, how you manage, how you set objectives, how you do um, goal setting, how you assign responsibility as opposed to tell people what to do, um, how you know if your product's better, how you find out what the consumer wants most, um, uh, and then how do you relentlessly drive toward that, how, how do you uh, manage advertising and, and marketing? How do you manage product development to focus on the outcomes that customers most want? Uh, oh gosh, so much. How do you do user testing? Um, so many of the things that we applied I at Intuit was stuff that I learned from, from P&G. What uh, was your role at P&G? Oh, I was in, uh, in brand management, so started as a brand assistant, and then you go out to sales training out in the field. And then you come back as an assistant brand manager, and then you're promoted to brand manager. Um, so I, uh, when I left, I was the brand manager on the largest brand in our division, which was the food division, and that was Crisco Shortening, one of the five biggest brands in the company. Um, so that's, and then my wife, Signe, was in the um, uh, two of the soap divisions, and she wound up in the big soap division, um, which working on uh, detergents and uh, uh, dish soap. She wound up on Dawn dishwashing liquid. Working for some young whippersnapper brand manager that everybody thought would become, someday this guy will be president. And sure enough, he was uh, 20 years later. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so without P&G, uh, uh, boy, yeah, it just, I learned like a sponge there. And it was also, it was also difficult work for me. Um, uh, th that was not natural work, but boy, did I learn. Uh, so. And from there to Bain, do you want to, uh, we want to make sure we leave time to, to talk about into it, but can yeah. you mention Yeah, um, I could tell that my career was not going to finish in Cincinnati, um, that I was not going to become a lifer at the company. Uh, I wasn't getting along with my boss. At, I had some great bosses. When I was at ABM, I had an awesome boss, a guy from the South, uh, Wayne Hilton, <coughs> from whom I learned a ton, and who was just a great inspiring leader who got you to stretch beyond anything you knew and was really encouraging. And so I did some of my best work probably for Wayne. Um, and then I got promoted to brand manager, and I had a good boss who later was at Visa. And then they transferred some guy in uh, when my boss left from another division, and boy, we hit it off from the first phone call. Uh, I, when I found out he was going to be my boss, uh, I called and said, hey, Jim, hey, it's great. This is Scott. I'll be working for you. That's great. How, he said, how'd you find out? I said, well, you know, it's just the rumor on the floor. Oh, okay, bye. <laughs> that was the first phone call. And it went downhill from there. Um, so as happens in many cases, the reason I left at that time was because of my boss. I would have ultimately left, but I would have, actually, if I'd stayed, I would have wanted to get transferred in R&D and become a technical brand manager because I wanted to get closer to where products were made and designed. So that's what I, uh, if I'd held on, that's what I would have done. And I think that would have been a click better fit for me as well. Um, uh, but I was also looking for a change and I, uh, I had uh, friends who were working in consulting and a good friend who was at Bain, a classmate who was at Bain. And he was learning so much that I wasn't learning at P&G. So I'm a much bigger palette of learning about business. Um, so he got me interviewed and the West Coast office of Bain was growing. I interviewed with McKinsey, BCG, and Bain all in the Bay Area, which was the hardest offices to get into because it's where everyone else in their organization wanted to work. 
Uh, and I got offers from two, from McKinsey and from, from Bain, and took the, the Bain offer. Um, and then on the honeymoon, when Signe and I got married, I said, oh, oh, by the way, I'm, th I'm planning to move to California. <laughs> I, I know you like the Midwest, and I know you're loving P&G, but uh, <laughs> I've had enough. I'm heading west. So, uh, and Signe was doing great at P&G, and this was kind of tough for her. But so, she, uh, anyway, we moved west. She got a job at Clorox. I got a job at Bain. Um, and, and then she hated Clorox and went to work for software publishing. And that turned out to be very important because that reconnected me with software. And she was the first non-technical employee of software publishing other than the receptionist. And then I got to meet the people she was working with and I got to hear what they were doing. And, um, and so that got me intrigued with software again. Uh, what year was this? Uh, she joined software publishing <coughs> in either late 19, I think late 1981. Um, and then one day she complained about doing the bills. And it clicked. Oh, this is a classic P&G kind of problem. Find a problem that everybody has. Like for P&G, tooth decay or kids that poop into smelly diapers or clothes that are dirty or underarms that are smelly. Um, so find out a problem that lots of people have, maybe everyone, where you can use technology to invent, um, to solve the problem and invent a much better solution. I said, ah, this feels like a P&G problem. Everybody's got to pay bills. My wife's complaining about it. And she's good at it. It's just, you know, it was not fun. It was a pain and wasted her time. I said, software, computers could be very good at this. Um, because to manage a checkbook, all you need is simple arithmetic and simple data storage and a simple display. You could do it on an 80-column green screen, which is what we had then. And the printout can be dot matrix um, because a check is, because it's all numbers and words. So it just clicked, ah, this technology would solve that problem if you just had the right software. So, so that was the pattern recognition that happened because of the P&G experience. Was it immediate for you, or did it take some percolating for you to put those pieces no, together? No, quick. You know, you, you tend to see problem and solution kind of at the same time. Um, and and that's, so that's where the programming experience that I had was really helpful, because I had enough knowledge about what a machine could do and couldn't do. Because um, it's just as important what you say no to. Um, so then I said, okay, well, I've got a market of one so far, my wife. Is there anyone else like her? It would seem that there'd be other people with the same, who would f have the same problem, but I don't know that. So then I started to do what you do at P&G. Well, let's go do the market research. So I went to the Palo Alto Library and got the phone books for Palo Alto and for Winnetka, Illinois, and started calling people to ask, well, what do you do in your personal finances? And then, do you do this, 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 and how often do you do it? So for the, there's a habits and practices research where you first find out what are people's practices and then get their attitudes. So then I asked them you know, what they liked and didn't like. Um, and sure enough, my wife was not unusual. Most people do just the basics uh, in their personal finances because they don't like doing the work and they just wish it were done. And so that thesis, based on observing her, turned out to be borne out uh, from interviewing uh, 100 uh, people in upscale neighborhoods. So then I went and looked at the competition. Turns out this was not a new idea. Um, there were already products out that did personal finance, so I went and bought the market leader and said, okay, what customers want is for this to be fast and easy. How much time does, how, does this product save? Because if they've already aced it, well, then there's no sense in me doing it. I'll just buy this for her as a gift and we'll be done. Uh, so I bought the home accountant and tried it. And oh my God, it was terrible. <laughs> it was hard to learn, so non-intuitive. It made no sense. And then it was slow, it was so slow to get the work done because <clears throat> the screens were badly organized and, it, oh, and try to print a check on it. Oh my God, if you wanted to actually enter the information just once, so it would go into your check register and then go on the check. Oh, that was hellaciously difficult. I said, this is awful. 
But then I, I knew from the bestseller list, so there were the beginnings of the bestseller list, and this would rank number nine or ten on the bestseller list. So people are buying this thing, but it's, there's, a, there's an incongruity here. Something doesn't fit. This totally fails to deliver on the benefit that I thought people wanted, get the work done fast and easy. Yet people are buying it. So something doesn't fit. So I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my research was wrong. So then I had to find out what was happening to the users, the people who bought this product called the Home Accountant. And so I had to find users. So I went to software stores, uh, computer stores at the time, and I uh, started interviewing people at the software magazines, which fortunately were located generally out here in California. And I found uh, and interviewed people who'd bought the Home Accountant. And the first question was, have you bought any personal finance software? And 65% of the people in the industry had. Next question, do you use that personal finance software? 4%. So 65% bought, 4% use. So you got them into the tent and they walked out. So then the question was, well, why not? Why did you stop? And the answer was, oh, too hard, too slow, took too long, wasted my time, couldn't understand it. And so now I had solved the riddle of the incongruity in, in in fact, they were buying it because they hoped it would save them time. It didn't deliver, so they stopped using it. And that said, there was an opportunity here. Now, there were other competitors coming in, and I, was, I knew there were two more that rumors had it that were going to be announced. So I lived in fear that somebody else would figure this out because it was so obvious. But no one did. I went and I found one of the competitors who was about to enter, and I interviewed the CEO to find out what he was doing and what his... And no, they believed that more features were better. They had no interest in making it faster easy. They were adding pretty colored graphs, and they were adding budgets, and they were adding investment accounts and balance sheets. Well, I never found a consumer who did a balance sheet in the research. So they kept adding more and more of what no one does. Um, so uh, the idea kept looking better and better. That initial hunch got validated by the research, got validated by the competitive research. Uh, got validated as the competitors kept moving away from the space. It was a race for more features in their, in their view. And we were going to build a product with f almost no features. Um, so I checked with banks to see what was happening with online banking, and I found what a mess that was back then. Uh, um, so anyway, the idea kept looking better and better. And some of the other business ideas I had, you start researching them and boom, they get worse and worse. This one got better and better. Meanwhile, my work at Bain was not going very well. Uh, the office was having to downsize because we'd lost key clients, uh, and I was part of the downsizing. So, and I started designing screens on the side. I started researching how you build easy-to-use software. And then, uh, and then I toyed with the idea of coding it myself, but that would have been a bad idea. So then I said, I gotta get somebody to come be my co-founder and help build this someone who knows how to build software. So that's what led me on the track to find uh, Tom. Um, so that fateful day, you went, went over to Stanford. Is that right? Mm-hmm. We'll probably talk more of that Monday night, because I'm sure that's, you know, that's because we really date the founding of the company from when Tom and I got together. Since this is part of it, could you just say, what was it that made you recognize and decide to go ahead with Tom, of all the possible people. It was a chance meeting, right? Oh, totally chance, yeah. Um, but the, um, and we'll talk about that Monday night, but now your question. He um, was different from the other ones I, I interviewed. The other ones were engineers who loved engineering for the engineering, for the problem of writing the software, coding. He was much more expansive in his view. He was interested about what customers wanted. He was interested in business. He, he, he could absorb this idea that we're building for consumers and we're going to optimize and design for consumers, which nobody was doing at the time. Um, software was written, designed and written by engineers for engineers and then launched, which is how Home Accountant came to be. And he, he was different than the others. He was an athlete. He was a team player. He, um, he was just a cut above. Um, any of the rest that I talked to. Uh, and boy, it turned out such a right decision because we needed, we needed a company of entrepreneurs 
and he was a great entrepreneur, uh, side by side. Uh. Well, that is a remarkable journey that we're going to talk about on Monday when you're together, but I did want to hear your perspective on that. Um, can you talk about a little bit about um, the decision for the essential features and the naming, too, before we kind of fast forward a little bit, too? Uh, well, the features ahead. came out of the research, <coughs> and it was the smallest set of things that would allow you to pay bills, keep a record of what you did, a check register, um, and then keep that accurate through reconciling to the bank if you chose to do it, and, and then allow you to figure out where the money went. And so it was the minimal feature set. We left out everything else. So there was no budgeting, no investments, no balance sheet, um, no credit cards. We managed a single checking account. Um, and so that was, you know, also we were so little and had no money, you wanted the smallest feature set. Uh, but also that was, you know, our whole goal was to automate the stuff people do and leave out the stuff they don't. Um, I'd say what was different about our approach was um, the user testing. So while we were in development, we'd got the, the product uh, halfway built, and then we would bring in users who had never seen it. In this case, we, could, um, we didn't have any money, so we went to the local Palo Alto Junior League and said, we'll have coffee and donuts. Who wants to come and try computer software? So we recruited people, in this case women, who had never touched a computer. We figured, okay, if we can make it great for people who've never used a computer, then it's gonna be great for everyone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then we'd put them in front of a computer. We wouldn't show them the manual. We wouldn't show them the quick reference card we were building. And we'd say, here's a stack of bills. Go pay these bills. And we'd watch. And they would start trying. We'd see them do false starts. They'd get stuck. Uh, they'd make it part way and then stop and have a quizzical look, looking at this. And we were taking notes. And then afterwards, we'd interview them. So, okay, when you got there, what were you thinking? And we'd learn why the product was confusing. Now, we thought it was easy. We had just designed it. And I've learned principle. Every technology product is easy in the hands of its developer. Okay? But our goal was to make it easy in the hands of the customers. And those software companies weren't doing this at the time. All I was doing was borrowing another technique from P&G, who during development you always test with consumers. Um, acceptance tests and uh, paired comparison blind tests, so you can see what really happens when real people use it for real in their real home. So we were just doing that in this case. Uh, and then we'd go, we'd see where they got stuck, we'd see what was confusing, and then we'd go and rebuild it, redesign those parts, and we'd test again. And we'd find, okay, now it got through those things, now other steps are confusing. And then we go back and redesign and test again. So that was, and we kept doing it until pretty much a novice could pick it up and use it without needing instruction. Um, How long a time was that process? Excuse me, really. We, um, well, I hoped we could build the software in six months. Uh, Tom started working at it, on it. Uh, we, um, uh, we got together in March, we started the company in April, and I was hoping we'd have it out by the fall. The whole process actually took us 18 months. Um, part of that was we didn't know what we were doing. Part of that was the usability testing. Part of it was that I had talked to some of the experts, again, learned from the wheel makers, and they had told me, oh, write this in basic. Something like this should be written in basic. Because they thought it was a tiny little thing. They didn't know how much we were going to try to do to make it work like the real thing. Like, Tom designed a check register design that looked and worked like a real check register, which made it much harder to code. But anyway, I, so I went in and said, Tom, we're going to write this in basic. And Tom said, no, 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 I, I know Python. Let's write it in Python. I said, no, we're going to do it in basic. Well, that was a horrible decision uh, that I forced on Tom. Basic was terrible for writing this. Um, and so that slowed us down. So I, I can't allocate how much time the usability testing took Sure. Yeah. One of the keys to Quicken's success, I think, was the fact that you had a check as, an, as the simple interface. Did you start that way, or did that come later? Um, I started that way with a check. So I, I think you're right. I think one of the key things was that Quicken did, the others didn't do, was the concept of uh, we reused the commonly known metaphor. In this case, the visual metaphor of a check 
and a check register. So that had made intuitive sense to me as far as the check, and my earliest designs had a check. The screen looked like a check. But I, I then got inspired when um, the Lisa was launched, and a buddy of mine at Bain & Company had left and gone to work for Apple in the Lisa division. And so he took me over, and I was anxious to learn about it, heard all this buzz. He took me over into Apple and showed me a Lisa. Um, and I was at GOG. Oh my God, look at that. Screens that look like the real things. Files, paper files, file folders. Wow, they're really emulating on the screen the real objects you would use. I can remember, I was so agog with all the insights that I observed when Peter, Peter Ripp was his name, showed me the Lisa, that I left the Apple headquarters and went to the nearest restaurant I could get to, which was a Bob's Big Boy, and just sat there eating a milkshake, writing down what I had learned. Oh my God. And then went back and shared it with Tom. And then Tom was able to use those concepts and came up with a, making the database not look like a database, which everyone else had done. Because a regular human would not know a database from a hole in the wall. Well, actually, no, they'd be much more familiar with a hole in the wall. <laughs> but instead, he just figured out how to make it look and work like a check register which was brilliant, because it turns out the check register screen, the database, was the most frequently used part, as it turned out, of Quicken. And he made it the same layouts, the same thing where you add the transaction at the end, um, and if it has a different date, it automatically places in the right place. It scrolls page by page, just the way a check register did. Much harder to code. In fact, it slid so you could see the transactions moving, uh, as opposed to snap, you know, if it snap changed, you wouldn't know what happened but we had it slide. So you know, oh, it's scrolling up and down to make it evident by its appearance. And nobody else had done that. It was vastly harder to code, particularly on an 80 column green screen. Um, but this was Tom taking the principle and applying it uh, far beyond where I had, had thought. Um, so that's, uh, but another piece of this was, again, learn from the best will maker. I knew that I didn't know much about ease of use in software design. Um, but if we were going to make this succeed, it had to be drop dead easy for people who are novices. So I went uh, to do research. I said, OK, where am I? let me find the easiest to use software. And I checked with the software stores, the computer stores, what's the easiest things you sell? And they said, there are two things, Bank Street Writer, a word processor for kids, and uh, the PFS series of software. So I <clears throat> called people at both companies. I called the people at Bank Street Writer, which is in New York, and I said, who's the designer who designed the ease of use? And I talked to that person, and he didn't know what he was doing. He just left out almost every feature. He had no principles, no rules. I learned nothing from the guy. But then I talked to Software Publishing. Fortunately, by dumb luck, my wife worked there. So she introduced me to the, one of the three founders who was the designer and head engineer, and he had been at HP. He'd written the book at HP on ease of use software design. He had principles, he had examples. So, oh, I just went to school with this guy at his, you know, at his uh, knees, learning from him. John Page was his name, and he, he taught me the principles, he gave me examples, I would show him designs, and he would give me comments. Um, and he, uh, he today <clears throat> will say that Intuit did a better job implementing his principles than his own company that he was co-founder of, Software Publishing. <laughs> it's um, quite a tribute. <laughs> yeah, so this is that principle. I learned at P&G the name for the principle. Don't reinvent the wheel, learn from the best wheel maker. And this was, a, I mean, this was a founding example. If we hadn't done that, we would not have been able to get the software as easy as it was. So, came out of the gate, you had the problem, you had a solution. But things didn't take off quickly, did they, in terms of funding and other things? No, we were a total flop for years. Yeah, uh, so no, it didn't take off. No, let's uh, talk anything. about we, that I as thought, part of the entrepreneur's journey. Yeah, I thought this would be easy to get funding for. So we pushed off the date that we went out to look for funding. Because I figured, this is a slam dunk. We've got a clear problem. We've got stopwatch time trials of the competitors all being worse than doing it by hand. And I wanted the software to be largely done because the one doubt you could have about us is, well, we'd never done software. I worked at Procter & Gamble, and Tom was still a student at Stanford, hadn't graduated yet. So I figured people would have real doubts about our ability to technically pull it off. 
So instead of going out for funding in 83, we went out in 84, when the software was now mostly done. So we could say, hey, try it yourself. And I thought this would be easy. We don't even need a business plan. Wrong. We got uh, shut down by every venture capitalist we talked to, including classmates, in business school classmates. We didn't get a penny from the venture capitalists. Um, what was the stated reason? Well, usually when venture capitalists turn you down, they don't give you a reason. They, they just kind of disappear into the night. Um, uh, it's not for us, or... But if you, if you go in and start learning and start asking and drilling, um, first of all, I mean, I think it's a lot of very good reasons. First of all, this was not the team you'd bet on. None of us had done software before commercially. Uh, you know, I was a former fat and oil salesman, and Tom was a student. Secondly, we were planning to take the money, since the software was largely developed, by using my savings, my uh, retirement uh, plan from Bain, uh, and borrowing from my dad, we'd largely spent the money on the technology. We were going to spend the venture money on marketing, on advertising. And VCs at the time had never invested in advertising. They didn't understand it. And it makes sense. If you don't understand something, you probably shouldn't invest. Um, th thirdly, most software at the time was sold to companies. The idea of consumer software hadn't really happened yet. And VCs typically sold products to companies. You sold chips to companies. You sold products like VisiCalc to companies. So the whole idea of selling to consumers was out of their experience. And lastly, I'd say a set of a very good logic. First of all, we were building for the IBM PC. And this was 1984. And people say, well, I think it's unlikely that households will buy PCs. This is a $3,500 machine today, probably equivalent of, who knows, 10, 12,000. I don't think homes are going to buy these. Secondly, if I'm wrong and by some accident homes buy IBM PCs, then they're not going to use it for personal finance. That's a stupid use of a computer. I said, I grant you that. With all the existing products, it is stupid. But, and they said, well, no one's using them today for personal finance, so I don't think they're going to use it for personal finance. And thirdly, if by some luck they actually do use it for personal finance, they're not going to buy your product into it. They're going to buy something from the established leaders because those products have lots of features. And features is what sells software. The more features, the better. And you're telling me into it you have almost no features. Yeah. And you're proud of it. Yep. So I think at the bottom end, at the bottom line, we were in a different paradigm. The industry was in an enterprise where we sell technology to corporations who buy features. Um, we were in a consumer paradigm where people want their problem solved and they're not trying to buy a lot of features. They're trying to get something they can use that's easy. And that paradigm, the gulf between those two paradigms was immense. And so we believed we were right and all those investors thought we were wrong. I, we were totally non-consensus because of we were coming from a consumer paradigm, from a P&G paradigm. Now what ultimately happened was all of our competitors in personal finance went bankrupt because they had the wrong paradigm. They were treating consumers as if they were a corporation. And eventually, when we got through a long valley of death, um, we had the right paradigm. And everyone could then see it, but only after it was successful. So, uh, you know, in hindsight, it was probably a great thing to get no venture capital because it meant that Tom and I and then Eric owned the company, or at least almost all of it. And what we were doing was so radically different that probably having venture capitalists on our board then would have forced us to hew to the old paradigm, the enterprise paradigm, and we would have wound up doing the wrong things, like our competitors. God, I remember one competitor went and got a huge booth, startup, doing personal finance, same time as us, huge booth at Comdex. Oh, God, they must have paid a fortune. But consumers don't go to Comdex. So, and you can see the booth was entirely empty. Money just pissed away. But that's what every other company did, because if you were selling to corporations, corporations went to Comdex. Um, so, yeah, so uh, it was probably a gift, but at the time, not getting venture capital, but at the time, 
it was the first of our existential crises. The, the, we almost didn't make it because. Uh, so in this valley of death, uh, can you say more, especially for our entrepreneurs who are trying to learn from looking at your experience about what do you think was critical on that journey of death and then what ultimately got you across that chasm? Um, yeah, so what ultimately turned out to be critical to get through this long valley of death when investors didn't be believe, stores wouldn't carry the product, and at the time all software was sold through stores. Journalists wouldn't write about it, or if they did, they wrote demeaningly. Ultimately, when the business took off, and I went back to research why. Why were people buying it? Even though we were doing advertising and things like that, the main reason people were buying it is word of mouth from a friend. Now, why were friends telling friends about it? Because of the work we did on ease of use in 1983 and 4, and the usability testing, and the learning from software publishing on the ease of use principles. Um, we did another thing. We decided that ultimately the thing that needed to be standardized was user interface. Back then in the DOS era, software had all these different interfaces. The interface you saw in VisiCalc was totally different than the interface design you'd see in WordPerfect. Uh, totally different keys, did different things, and this was really hard. Every software product you learned, you had to learn an entirely different way of operating, which the keys did. And I concluded what's going to happen is what needs to be standardized is user interface. It need, they need to be the same across products. So I said, we're not going to invent a new user interface for ourselves. We're going to copy, slavishly copy, an existing one. The problem is on DOS, and that's ultimately what Apple did. They started enforcing, first on the Mac and then later on the phone, standardized user interface. And that's what Windows did, is create a standard user interface. But this was a decade before that. So who are we going to copy? The two most popular interface designs was the VisiCalc slash Lotus123 design, and then what Software Publishing was doing, um, because they had gotten very good traction on their database products. Well, the spreadsheet didn't fit what we were doing at all. Um, and the idea that you had to use command characters and things like that, and at signs if you're going to do a formula, none of that worked. So we went to Software Publishing and said, we want to copy your interface, and we will license it from you. And they... Um, we paid them a buck, had a contract, paid them a dollar, and then did a pixel by pixel copy of their user interface. So it looked exactly the same. We used the same keys to do the same things in, that they did so that users would not have to learn a new interface. Um, uh, and that may be the first example I'm aware of of what's now common uh, in software as you, you try to go with it and design it to work the way people are already expecting. But ultimately, so what caused people to buy it? It was the word of mouth from friends, and that came because of all the diligent work we had done to find the biggest problem we could solve. Solve it, stopwatch time travel to make sure we were sol saving time, um, and then design it to be real easy. Um, so that's ultimately what is that attention to being so customer-centric on the design. Thinking about lessons for entrepreneurs, just to pick up you know, there had to have been a million reasons to give up. People, you know, every VC, stores saying no. Um, personally, like what, what kept your drive alive and Tom's drive alive? I think it was two things. One, we knew we had a better product. We knew we solved customer, the consumer problem, and no competitor did. And the competitors were selling. People were buying, which means they were getting screwed. They were buying a product which 90 plus percent of the time they would stop using within a month or two. And so we had the kind of messianic zeal to say, no, we're missionaries to get people to a better life because they're getting hosed by these existing products. Um, in fact, when we we kept alive for a while by selling to banks when we couldn't get into the stores. In my standard selling demonstration, we'd have a whole bunch of bankers from, say, Mellon Bank in a room, and I'd say, who's most 
um, technically proficient here. And they'd get somebody from an IT background and say, okay, here's the market leader. Here, it's on the computer. I'd bring a compact, put the floppy in. So this was home account initially and then managing your money. Here's their manual. Now, here's a bill. Write and print a check for this bill. We put the most technically proficient person. And then we just watch. Never. I probably did this at 20 banks. Never. And probably at least twice per bank, so that's at least four times. Never was anyone able to use the competitor, to do the market leader, to do the simplest thing, write and print a check. It was impossible to figure out on your own. You had to read and study the manual. So after they got frustrated, I'd let them go as long as they wanted. Some of these IT guys kept going because they didn't want the computer to beat them. They didn't want to look stupid in front of... So they finally give up, and I said, okay, okay, we'll take those floppies out. Here's Quicken, we'll put that in, same bill, but I won't give you the manual and I won't give you the quick reference card. And now figure it out. It generally took five minutes max and they were printing a check. So you could see that, it was undeniable. So that kept us going. Um, and the other thing was, you know, I had funded this thing, so I'd funded it by um, borrowing money from my dad, using all of my savings, and then I kept borrowing from my dad, and then we, when we struck out with venture capital, we got two rich people to put in 151,000. We wanted two million, but all we could, all we could get was 151,000. And then we'd burn through their money. And I then figured out that I was tanking my dad's retirement. He grew up poor. This was his life savings that he was gonna retire on. And I was sucking this. Um, and so I knew that if we closed the company, I was gonna have to pay off my dad. And I felt honor bound I'd have to pay off the investors. Even though they bought equity, you know, I took their money, I, and so I looked at the amount of money we were eating and the number of years through an, on a salary job that it would take me to earn to pay the money off, and that would be, you know, a decade or more with no vacations, no spending on anything I wanted just to earn the money. I said, boy, I, shutting down is really ugly because I own the money. So we kept going because the only way to pay them back was to get some way to get the business to work a little bit so I'd make enough money to be able to pay down the debt. So that kept me, I mean, if, if someone would have walked up to me, and Tom was shocked when I later told him, Tom and Ginny and that, if someone had walked up to me and said, hey, I'll take this thing off your hands. I'll pay down half your debt. I would have said, here are the keys. Because I just couldn't see how I, I mean, Signe's a planner and a wonderful planner. And she'd ask, well, what's the plan? I said, well, there is no plan. The plan didn't work. <laughs> so we don't have a plan now. <laughs> So it was really, I mean, we had to stop paying salaries, um, had to stop spending money of any kind, because, you know, I still remember Tom Lefevre, who kind of came in, I brought in to be kind of our chief operating officer. Uh, he's very diligent, very detailed, and we needed that. He took me out to Round Table Pizza on University Avenue and said, Scott, let me walk you through the numbers. You know this, we've been trying to get more revenue, we've been trying to do these deals, and we ain't getting those deals, so we will run out of money in two months. It's gonna to go to zero, and then we'll have to close our doors. Unless we start, unless we turn off the tap on all spending right now. Um, and so that's what we did. I went in front of the employees the next day and said, <clears throat> well, we will pay you for all the time you've worked, but we can't pay you for the days going forward. And I'd dearly love you to stay, but I, I know Probably you'll have to go get a job at a company that actually pays money. And I don't know when we might be able to start paying you again. Um, but we have to conserve every penny we have to keep the company alive. Um, so that's how desperate we, we, we were. Uh, Dire times. So that was only the second of our existen existential crises. More crises to come. but. Let's talk about those in the time that we have. Time is going by too quickly. Scott, this is the afraid. Um, crises, inflection points, if you could just continue those part. And then this, you started to talk about your, sort of your mantras, these ideas that have been signature, things that you've brought and kept at the company and developed. I want to make sure we get to those. So we tee up those two sets of topics next. You know, what's, what's interesting as you look at the company, if you look at the facts of the company, that from 1986 on, 
we basically grew at a monotonic rate. We tripled year after year, if you're tripled, then a triple, and then a triple, and then a triple, then a triple, then a triple and then our growth slowed down to 80%, and then it's, you know, it's done the, but you can't look at the results and see an inflection point. In fact, it was a very continuous, um, once we started gaining revenue. Um, and why did we start gaining revenue? We've talked about that. It was the attention and detail we put into the product design. But then I would look for what were the things that changed our destiny, even if they didn't change us in the current tense, even if you couldn't tell at the moment. So one of those was we uh, got banks to start buying the software and reselling it. If, we, if that hadn't worked, we wouldn't be here. And that's what started the software uh, sales that started us tripling. That's what got us the users who told their friends. Then we, we could tell banks were not going to, banks were more a, having banks sell packaged software was more of a desperation move. Um, then we had to get software to sell, Quicken to sell through regular channels, so then we figured out how to get retail to work, selling through retail stores. Then I'd say the next change in mindset was a long story, which we can talk about separately when we just went into selling software to businesses. We'd never planned to sell to businesses. This was going to be a consumer software company. But by 1991, we were selling payroll software, which is only used by businesses. And then QuickBooks, starting in 92. Um, and that changed our future. Though you couldn't see it in results at the time. Uh, then I would set, say the next big change in our future was something that Tom Prue led. This one you could see. This led big impact at the time and huge impact since, and that was the acquisition of Chipsoft to get us into tax software. And this was really led, piloted, uh, determined by Tom. Tom really drove this. I would not have done it, but Tom drove it. And by God, he was right. He was so overwhelmingly right. Um, so that changed our future. Uh, that then, I'd already by this point, 11 years in, decided that we needed to bring someone in to run the company who had skills that I didn't. So that led to the hiring of Bill Campbell to be our CEO. And again, you don't see any trajectory change in the company, but boy, without having Bill, we couldn't have scaled like we could. We couldn't have developed the leadership team we did. We couldn't have managed the combination of Chipsoft and Intuit. Um, Tom just, Tom, uh, Bill just brought immense skills exactly where we needed it and exactly where I didn't have the skills. And suddenly we needed to be world class and he brought that. Then I would say it was the, uh, that takes you into the mid 90s. Then it was the drive of some of our product teams to get our products in the cloud. So by 99 and 2000, we had both QuickBooks and TurboTax in the cloud. They got horrible volume. Almost nobody bought them. Everyone was still stuck on desktop software, buying a box with a disk in it. But thanks to kind of entrepreneurial talent in both our San Diego and Northern California locations, we had teams who got us, uh, true believers who said it's going to be better to be online. Um, so guys like Craig, Craig Carlson and Dan Wilkes, for example. Uh, and so we were very early to get packaged software online. Um, during this uh, whole theme, another of our brushes with death was when Microsoft decided to enter. There's a whole story, which we can talk separately. Um, but that became a curse that we had to live with for a decade. Um, as they had slain every competitor they had gone up against. Every competitor had gotten pounded into the dust by Microsoft. And not because Microsoft was bad, because they were good. They were really good at software. They were really good. They understood network effects. They understood pricing. They, were, uh, they had the operating system. They were powerfully good. And then we found out that they were coming after little pipsqueak into it. And if it wasn't for Eric Dunn, we wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for Eric Dunn, 
and then helped by uh, Mary Baker, they would have wiped us off the map, um, just as they had every prior opponent they had tackled. What did Eric do? Oh, it's a long story. We had no Windows engineering capability in the company. Uh, we had Mac and DOS. And when Microsoft told us they were coming, we said, oh shit, we gotta do this fast, oh boy. So we hired an outside firm to port DOS Quicken to Windows. And they were a firm uh, with nothing but Windows engineers. So, you know, we were pinning our hopes basically, because Microsoft said they would be out in one year with a Windows version of a finance product. And we actually thought they'd probably beat that timing. And so we knew we had no more than 12 months. Well, six months in, there was a major review that Tom and Eric did with this outside contractor. And Eric figured out, uh-oh, and Eric had a hunch of this already. He could tell they weren't understanding the code enough to be porting it, because they would have to be asking him questions about the code. He'd written the code. So the, the DOS version of Quicken had been rewritten by Eric. Uh, Eric led the, the, and so he'd written a lot of the key spots, and he knew you couldn't understand it without talking to him. They weren't asking. So he could tell they weren't making progress. And then he and Tom went in and did a deep look, and they weren't. They basically, Tom concluded they were not going to finish. So Eric said, okay, I'll take it over. Let me pick the team. All I ask for is a BMW M3 when we're done. So Tom decided on the spot, that's a deal. Eric picked some of our best engineers, and they basically moved into a conference room, and they coded night and day nonstop, because now we'd lost six months of time. We had six months to do it, and Eric led it, so we launched only one month after Microsoft. And then one month later, we added the features that Microsoft had that we didn't, uh, and then Mary Baker put together a scorched earth marketing plan. We cut the price really low, we marketed really heavily, we, we just went with all guns blazing, because this was our moment of truth. If, if we didn't hit them so hard, everyone would assume that Microsoft's gonna do it again, and it, all the magazines, the stores would just start selling the Microsoft product. We had to hit them so hard that everyone said, oh, well, that's new. Look, Microsoft is losing. That's never happened before. So we, and so Mary developed a plan more aggressive than I would have, and she was right. Uh, we even went and started pitching Microsoft, the other parts of Microsoft, you should promote with us because we've got a lot of customers. Microsoft money, they have hardly any customers. So we even got the operating system part of Microsoft to start promoting with Quicken for Windows instead of Microsoft for Windows, which really hacked off the Microsoft money team. <laughs> I see why. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we were not afraid to work with any uh, company that wanted to help our cause. Um, and so that, yeah, with that, that was uh, an existential threat like we'd never faced. Um, and thanks to Eric and Mary, um, uh, we were the winner, not the loser. <laughs>